Hey everybody, Alan here. Going to talk about active shooter response training and why it's important and what it could do for you. You know, because some people are out there, they don't believe a short class or a little bit of knowledge will do any good. And I want to explain and answer some questions of why it will. So, you know, that's what we're going to talk about today. Is we're going to talk about what the training will do and how it can help you. And I'm going to try to hear, I'm going to do a little bit. I'm going to be trying to watch on both com computers, so let me do a couple little things before I get started. Um, so bear with me as I share this around, and please go ahead and share it as well. You know, get this stuff out there so we can help people. And let's see, got a couple people joining, so that's great. But I want to try to get this shared. So if you'd share it a little bit, then we'll get this around. Then I'll start answering some questions. And we're going to talk about what active shooting response training can do. Okay, we're getting set up here. Bear with me as I do a couple of these posts. All right, so... Hey Lana, how's it going? I see you. Um, got a couple different people saying hi, so that's great. like to have people on here. So let's talk a little bit about training. Why is it worth anything? And what can it do for you? Because, and I'm doing this because some people say that a short course cannot help you. And I'm here to say that you are correct, that I can't turn you into a military operator, a special forces troop, or even a ninja in a half a day. But you don't have to turn into a ninja. You don't have to be a law enforcement op officer. You don't have to be a military special forces operator to increase your survivability rates in a situation. And that can be an active shooter. It can be any active threat. And a little training will go a long ways. And here's something that will illustrate that. I want to read a little passage out of the book, The Unthinkable by Amanda Ripley. Um, it hits really home of why just a little bit can save lives. The National Transportation Safety Board has found that passengers who read the safety information card are less likely to get hurt in an emergency. In a plane crash at Pago Pago three years before the Tenerife accident, all but five of the 101 passengers died. All the survivors reported that they had read the safety information cards and listened to the briefing. They exited over the wing while other passengers went toward other, more dangerous but traditional exits and died. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm trying to teach people in the classes. I'm teaching people to get your head out of your apps and pay attention. Hey Art, thanks for saying hi, good to see you here. Gordon, same, thanks for saying hi. Hello Willie, Richard. Um, Lana saying hi to some other people, great to have you all here. Share this around, comment, get it going because that's what helps people see it. Back to what I was saying about you know the little example from Amanda Ripley's book. People that paid attention, they knew where that exit was, they got out and lived. Five out of 101, and those all those other people were going up to the traditional exit, and they died. And that's why in a lot of my classes, you can see it in my YouTube videos and in my other courses as well, where I talk about knowing your exits. Most people will run out or go for wherever they came in, not realizing that there are other exits that could have saved their lives. Okay, you can go to those alternative exits and you're not in the crowds to get stampeded. You know, not everybody dies in these emergencies, whether it's active shooter or other emergencies from the explosion or from the gunfire. People die because they get trampled and they get crushed by other people in the panic and the chaos that's going on. So if you can avoid that and go to a different exit, you can live. And that's some of the things that I'm teaching in my classes. I'm trying to change the mindset. You know, Lana just laughed when I said keep people, you know, getting people to keep their head out of their apps and paying attention. If I can do that, if I can get people in these classes to be more aware, they have a better chance of surviving. 
a lot of the places that I teach, they're not allowed to have firearms. You know, they're not allowed in schools and a lot of the businesses that I'm teaching in. But most people don't even think of a fire extinguisher as being an improvised weapon. I teach people how to use that fire extinguisher to keep themselves alive. Okay? So it's that change in mindset. Okay, so that's the important thing. And I had a question earlier. I don't want to forget it because Michael asked this question. I want to make sure that I get it in. And he was asking about a trend in the United States of active shooters wearing body armor and if that would change the targeting one must have. Um, I don't know for sure if it's a trend or not, Michael. Um, the stats from 2000 to 2010, which are the best statistics we have compiled by the FBI, about 4% had body armor. Since then, I do know there have been a few more that have body armor, but I don't know if that 4% has gone up or not. And that, so I don't want to speculate if it has or not. But it is true that some have body armor. And that would change the targeting of anybody that is facing them with another weapon. Um, so, especially for law enforcement. Because most of the time, I'm not teaching people to go at them with their own firearm. There are courses that teach handgun and firearm training and what to do in an active shooter situation. That's not part of the courses that I'm teaching because I'm primarily in schools, hospitals, businesses, places where they're not you know, allowed to carry firearms, you know, government buildings and such. And so the people that I'm teaching are usually not armed. Since we're on that topic, though, because some of them are have body armor, it does make a difference to how our law enforcement are trained to respond. And because some of them are having higher caliber weapons, it's important for our law enforcement to have good body armor when they're facing these individuals. And so that's why we need to support our law enforcement agencies to make sure they have the proper equipment when they go against these others that are trying to take lives. Hey, Dwayne, I see you're here. Better late than never. Great. Good to have you. You know, share this around. Ask questions if you have them. You know, I'm basically talking about the benefits of active shooter training and what I can provide in my classes, you know, and why it's important to have some of that training. Now, if anybody here is in an admin position or an executive position of a company, pay close attention. If you're an employee of somebody, you might want the further up to know this because people say, well, it's too expensive to get training. Well, it can be expensive not to get training when lives are at stake. And if you're just worried about bean counters, that they're putting a dollar on lives, well, Sandy Hook was sued after that tragic incident where those children and teachers were killed. And some of the reasons Sandy Hook was sued, named in the lawsuit, one, they didn't have the laminate on the glass. And that's how the guy got in. He shot out the windows. I talk about putting laminate on in, in my writings, in my book, in my courses as a way of hardening the target. Another thing in the lawsuit, the doors were not easily locked down. You know, they had to go out in the hall and use a key to lock the door and then pull it shut to, to lock their classrooms. Um, terrible lockdown procedures. You need to have better facilities and better locks and better procedures to lock down a building. Another reason that was named in that lawsuit, they didn't have training for all the teachers and substitutes that were working. Um, the exact kind of stuff that I'm talking about, the exact kind of stuff that I'm going out and doing in the schools and hospitals and medical facilities and whoever wants to bring me in, getting that training for employees. Um, so they have a plan. And it's not a huge plan, like I read in that book earlier, a small plan can save lives. Um, one of the instructors on the team here in Missoula that does the longer course with the active scenarios, um, he likes to say, your computer is like, your, your brain is like a computer. So here's your computer up here. And if you've ever been on your computer and you see the little thing, file not found and it's not doing anything, our brain does that in an emergency. And that's what will freeze. We won't know what to do. File not found. File not found. The stuff that's being taught in these classes and the active shooter response courses, the survive a shooting course, it's giving your brain a file. So it gives you something to go to when the chaos is happening. 
I see Stephen says, do you agree with having a teacher, a company person who is trained being a CCW? It depends. You know, I am all for having, you know, a resource officer in a school that has a firearm. However, in Columbine, they waited till that guy was gone. Okay, I mean, so these students knew who had the weapon. They waited till he was gone and did stuff. So I'm all for people having a concealed weapon. But there's a lot of teachers that aren't going to, and I'm not insisting that teachers should have it. What I would insist is if the law provides for an avenue of someone armed to be at a school, at a business, in an institution, that that person should have training and be responsible. Um, and that's a huge responsibility that goes with taking that kind of position. Um, I'm s the run, hide, fight video. What's my opinion on it? Um, Vinny asked that. And if I miss things, I'm sorry. They go by sort of fast. Um, the run, hide, fight video is a good starting place. I personally, and I've changed the terminology in my classes, I like escape better than run. Because that also means going out the window or doing other things. And instead of just running, I want you to escape the danger zone. Hide, I hate the word hide. Now, if you watch that video close, they're not just hiding. They are barricading and they get ready to fight. So they're not just hiding under a desk. Um, they hid under desks at Columbine. And those six people walked in, and I'm not going to even give them any credit. They're just killer, sick people. They walked in and they shot people hiding under desks. I don't want you to hide. I want you to lock and barricade. And I like the word deny because I want to deny access. And that deny access could be putting some kind of cover between us, something that's bulletproof. It could be locking them out of the room. It, so I want to deny that person the ability to hurt me, not just hide. Um, the fight I like fight, but I use attack back because I want more of a proactive. You're going to attack that person. And you're not a bad guy. You're not going out and attacking innocent people. You're attacking back because he started it and it's the way to stop him. So run, hide, fight. Run, hide, fight is a good video. One of the first out there to help people. Um, I think I've expanded on those concepts in my courses and my posters and stuff. And I like attack, back, deny and escape as the terminology. And I explain that all in my books and other places too. Um, we got different things. Uh, Lana was actually asking about CCW. That's a concealed carry permit, Lana. So those that have a CCW, and it's called different things in different um, things, but concealed carry weapon. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. Those that are allowed to carry concealed because they have the permit. And that's only in certain places. So again, it's not the be all and end all. Um, hello, Alan. What do you think about teachers having a CCW permit like Texas? You know, I'm not against it. Like I said to Stephen, if you are trained and you're going to take that responsibility. Um, I've had people say they sh you should require all teachers to carry a weapon. And I think that's ridiculous because a lot of teachers went into teaching because they didn't want to be policemen and soldiers and such. And I've taught a lot of very good teachers that have no desire to touch a gun, to learn about guns. I, at least in my classes, we give a familiarity part so they know what they are and we try to take some of the fear away. But to require teachers, no. Now, if there is a teacher that has gone through all the training, is responsible and stuff, you know, that's going to be up to legislators to decide. In Texas, they did. Montana and many states, they still don't allow it. So I'm trying to teach my classes what they're allowed to do. And I'll modify to go with what they're allowed um, because I'm not in charge of making the laws and such. If the laws change, I'll modify my teaching to help those people to go with the laws that they have. Um, you're welcome, Vinny. Um, as you saw in the Manila event, most people that died were hiding in the latrine, died of smoke inhalation. Yes, that's why I don't like hiding. I, you know, escaping, denying access, attacking back. Um, and it's not a linear thing. A lot of people teach the run, hide, fight in a linear manner. I have other videos where I've talked about the triangle, and I have that triangle on my posters and in my PowerPoint, and I, I go over it in detail in the class. 
The key in that triangle is move. You got to do something. Whether you're going to escape, deny, or attack back will depend on the situation and your proximity to the shooter. Um, but just running and hiding in a latrine, never a good option. If you get stuck there when stuff happens, you got to be thinking and preparing, what can I do to make my position better? Because regardless of which part of the triangle you go to, you got to be ready to go to one of the others. If I'm escaping, I have to be ready to fight if I run around the corner and he's there, I attack back. If I'm attacking and I stop the threat, I got to be ready to escape the area. If I'm denying access by barricading the door, can I then escape out the window? We're always thinking and planning to make our position better. We're never hiding and hoping. That's just not a plan. Um, this is a must like. Okay, thank you, uh, Jerry. They joined. Got a couple others joining and saying thank you and good job. Appreciate it. If you have questions, please put them in there. Um, I love the positive questions. If I missed a question, put it back in because some of them are going by before I can answer them. Um, you know, without a question, I'll talk a little bit. So, what do I do in the classes that I teach? The four hour survive a shooting class involves a couple hours of PowerPoint that's interactive. It's not a boring, oh God, a death by PowerPoint. I make it engaging and I give you information that will help you. And I talk a little bit about the history because it's good to know because active shooters study other active shooters. That's proven. And they learn and they, they evolve. So that's why law enforcement and those of us that are in the business of helping others we're studying active shooters too, so we can improve the way we respond. So that's why I'm always studying books, events, live things, so I can make my class the information that's up to date and help people. Because they're doing it, we have to do it too. And then I go over some of the different models. And then I go over the mindset. The mindset is so important, and that's the biggest thing I can change in people in four hours. I can open up their eyes and change that mindset. Get their head out of their apps. Get them thinking about some different things. I go over the concepts that we just talked about. You know, the escape, ways to escape. I go about how you can deny. I go about how you can attack back. We talk about hardening the target. What you can do before that just to make your institute a harder target in the first place. We also talk about threat assessment teams and what your organization can do to be on the alert and things to look for so we can prevent these things in the first place. And believe it or not, a lot of these are prevented. You know, I applaud the gentleman that turned his daughter in a few months ago. You know, we, we saw that up in the Boston or somewhere over, up in the northern east part of the United States. Um, he turned his daughter in because she was planning something. And I hope she got the uh, help that she needed. There's definitely something wrong with her thinking and her wanting to do this. So by keeping our eyes open and knowing what to look for, we can stop these before they start. And so that's another thing I like to discuss. And then the second half of the program... We actually practice this stuff. We practice some of the barricading things. We practice some of the things you can do to attack back and stop a shooter. We take some of the scariness away from firearms by showing you how they work and letting people understand them. Okay? We also talk about stopping the bleeding. I am a firm believer that everyone should get some basic first aid training and everyone should learn how to use a tourniquet and learn how to stop hemorrhaging. That is the leading cause of death from wounds in war situations. It's the hemorrhaging. And so if we can learn how to stop hemorrhaging, it can not only help us in an active shooter situation, but car accidents, you know, anything where somebody's cut bad and bleeding. So it's a good idea to know how to use them. And it's a good idea to have one in your emergency or first aid kit. And most people don't have one. Most first aid kits that you buy don't have a tourniquet. So go to Amazon or one of the places that sells a reputable tourniquet. Don't buy the cheap knockoffs. Buy a real one that's, you know, a real cat tourniquet, the combat application tourniquet, going to run you about 30 some dollars. Um, don't buy a $10 one. Get a good one because someone's life could depend on it. 
you know, Lana saying exactly do something, no hiding and hoping. Great. Do you speak of post-event counseling? Not that much. Um, that's really beyond my expertise. I'm not a counselor. Um, I encourage people when they ask questions like you are to seek out the professionals in that field. Um, one of the organizations that br has brought me in to do some training, they have brought other experts in because they want to make sure that that medical facility, and they have several of them, you know, there in Virginia, they want to make sure that medical facility gets the best training for all of their employees they can. So, you know, they've brought me in to do what I do best. They bring other professionals in to do what they do best, and I applaud them for everything they're doing to make sure their employees are prepared for whatever may happen. So, as far as the counseling, I encourage it, but it's beyond my expertise, so I tell people you got to seek out the professionals in that field. Um, you spoke of mindset, kind of like a combat vet trying to explain war to a civilian. If you haven't been there, hard to comprehend. You know, that's true, Garen, but, you know, I also talk about the mindset that we have to get beyond stuff, and a lot of times, you know, if I'm talking to ladies, you know, you get that mother. They might not want to protect themselves, but you get that mother, you're going to protect your kids, and then you, they're worth fighting for, too, so I say, you're worth it, and you have to get beyond that, oh, squeamishness of bashing a guy's head in with a fire extinguisher, or grabbing the guy and sticking your thumb as far into his eye as you can. We have to get that mindset that we are worth fighting for. We also have to get the mindset that we're not going to die, we're going to survive. And I like to talk about Mike Day, the Navy SEAL in Afghanistan, shot 27 times, killed a couple people that were trying to kill him, made it to the medics, they saved his life, got him to the hospitals, he made it home to his family. He credits his family and his faith as the driving forces that kept him alive. And so when I talk to people, and I include this in all of my classes, I want them to find what it is that will keep them alive. Whether it's their family, their faith, or I think some of it should just be yourself because you're not done yet. you got things to do. But I try to get people to think about that. And that, that kind of survivor's mindset of you will do whatever it takes to survive. And I, I have a nice Fluffy the Bath story, and Fluffy the Cat in the Bath story that usually gets giggles out of people and laughs, but it gets them thinking in the right place. Got a couple more people joining. Um, Art says, thank you for the info. Great job on your Hop Keto Cane and Joint Lock DVDs. Um, thanks for mentioning those, Art. You know, I really try to put out DVDs that help people learn. Uh, and, you know, the Cane DVD is a really pet project of mine. I really wanted to do it. I appreciate Paladin Press bringing me down to Colorado and bringing a Todd who was working with me. Several other people came from Colorado. We all met to put that two discs together. Um, I like the cane because I may have to use one when I'm older. <laughs> you know, I've had knee surgeries and stuff, but it's also something that we can take on any airplane, any place we want to go and have that. And give me a cane against a box cutter any day. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm glad that you like those DVDs and they're helping you, and thanks for mentioning them. You know, I, I see Rod Fletcher just joined. You know, Rod and I go back, oh, 1986. God, that's a long time, Rod. We're getting old. Um, Rod and I used to jump, you know, Fletcher and I used to jump out of airplanes together in the 82nd Airborne. So, uh, hoo-ah, Rod. Airborne all the way. Um, it's always great to, you know... Remember back, you know, the kind of stuff that we did when we were young and dumb and jumping out of what some of my friends say were perfectly good airplanes. But I always tell them, no such thing as a perfectly good airplane. Um, but anyway, we got some, any other questions? Um, you know, I go a little bit, you know, when I talk about what I teach in the live classes, I don't teach a bunch of complicated gun disarms. And you can go to my website, Survive and Defend. You know, there's member pages there where there's a bunch of gun disarms. Because there's a lot of them. And I've learned a bunch throughout the different arts I've studied throughout the years. Some I like, some I don't like, some are okay. In these live short classes, we teach the simplest thing that you can do if you're by yourself. 
and I teach an extremely simple thing if you have at least one other person with you. What you can do to stop a gunman coming into your room, coming into the classroom because they made it through the barricade. Okay, so we're teaching really simple things. We're not turning people into ninjas or expert martial artists. We're teaching simple things that can save lives. And again, that mindset is the biggie. You know, Garen says, I carry mine cane everywhere, even on military travels. Certainly. And when I travel to a seminar where I have to take, you know, a bag of 20 or more canes, I, I have this big giant blue duffel bag uh, that I have full of canes when I'm teaching them to do a cane seminar. But when I'm traveling somewhere where I only need to take one, I don't take that big duffel bag. So I just walk through the airports with them. And I don't use it. I walk through the airport. You can take them anywhere. Don't weaponize them. Don't have swords or knives hidden in them. That'll get you in trouble if you try to go through TSA. Have a simple, basic cane. You can defend yourself with it, but you haven't weaponized it that will get you in trouble. Any other questions? I'm making sure I didn't miss some. Hopefully I didn't miss questions. If you, if you ask a question and I missed it, please put it back so I see it this time. You know, it looks like Thom just joined. Good to see you, buddy. Um, again, ask questions if you have them about active shooter training. What good is it? What can it do? I've been trying to explain it, but I've been asking the answer to questions too. You know, we're coming up on the anniversary of the uh, Orlando shooting. 49 people lost their lives that day. Uh, innocent people. I guarantee, without a doubt... If those people would have gone through my four-hour survive a shooting class, they would have been through the eight-hour armed intruder class that I teach under Safari Land with the team of instructors. If those people would have gone through one of those classes, 49 people would not have died. I can guarantee that because we would have changed those 300 people's mindset. And there's no way that one person should be able to kill 49 out of 300. Um, if they would have just had that different mindset and instead of hiding and if, if some of them would have attacked back and fought, they could have stopped that guy. I'm not saying no one would have died. He would have killed a few people, yes. But if they would have had the training and would have responded like we teach in the classes, um, 49 wouldn't have died. Yeah. I got a question here. Do most schools have good active shooter training? In Missoula they do. In Missoula, for the last three years, we've had a team that have been training the schools. And it's a little unusual because we have the University of Montana Police Department. We have the Missoula Police Department. We have the Missoula County Sheriff's Department. We have the Missoula County Schools. We have the University of Montana. We have the federal training officers in the lab. Um, and there's a few other organizations I'm probably missing, all working together to make sure the schools and the university and the other places in Missoula are safe and are getting the training. From what I understand, and this comes from Safari Land International and their big training group all through the United States, no other community in America is doing as much as we're doing. Um, so I don't know what kind of training other places are doing but I don't think it's near what Missoula is doing. Um, and one of the reasons I have the four hour survive a shooting class is so I can get out and train more areas and go there. And next year I'll be doing train the trainer events to train people to go back and teach their respective organizations and institutions. So you know, I'm gonna do everything I can to get people trained. And so they have at least a little plan because as I mentioned earlier, a little plan saves lives. You know, Michael says, what are the top two or three mistakes people make during an active shooting situation? Sorry if you already covered this. Had to help my daughter with her lemonade stand, so I missed much of your talk. Hey, I'm all for young entrepreneurs. Kudos to you for helping your daughter with a lemonade stand. I did stuff like that when I was a kid, and I can't drive around town without stopping at those. So I hope she does well. Um, but the three mistakes, the, one of the biggest is denying that it will ever happen. And just not thinking about it so you don't have a plan. You don't get training, you don't harden your target, you don't do the stuff I teach because you deny that it's ever gonna to happen to you. 
That's probably one of the biggest mistakes. Um, there's also the denial when the things start happening. You hear that, and it's like, well, you, oh, that couldn't have been that. And um, Then the next thing is, you know, the panic and hiding and not knowing what to do just because they've never trained, they've never thought out, and they didn't have a plan. Um, so hiding instead of barricading is another terrible one. That's why I don't like the run, hide, fight language, and I changed it for my courses. And Safari Land changed it for their course. They use run lock fight because Safari Land hated the hiding too. And and I've trained I'm certified through Safari Land. I've taught their program with that team, so I, I've gained a lot of knowledge for Safari Land. So I want to make sure I give kudos to them and acknowledgement to them that I've gained so much from the stuff I've done with Safari Land. And they didn't like the hide language either. Uh, so those I think are some of the bigger mistakes that we have with people with that kind of situation. Um, you know, I read earlier that passage from the book where the five people escaped the airplane out of 101 and all the rest died because the five read the safety card and listened and they went out the exit over the wing and all the other people went out the exit, the, the dangerous exit and died. Um, not knowing your exits and people going to the wrong place instead of escaping a better avenue, that would be a mistake as well. Um, Lana says, great job, Missoula. I agree. I, it, it's, it's very unique for Missoula to have all those entities come together to try to make our community safer. We've been doing it for over three years now, and we're not done. We're still training people on a regular basis. So thank you for applauding Missoula. I feel very fortunate to be in a community that was that committed and that spent that much resources. I mean, all those entities that I mentioned, the, the police departments, the university, the school, they were all paying to have this training done for all of these people. And we have stacks of evaluations saying this is some of the best training those people have ever had. And, you know, some people go through it more than once, but we're trying to get everybody through it at least once. So I feel fortunate to be part of that team. I cannot speak high enough about the fellow teammates that have been teaching that class and the support that we have had from all of the administrations from those departments to make Missoula safer. Um, let's see. Thank you, Alan. We'll be spreading your training. Really appreciate that. A library is letting you talk. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we actually did the, that, I, I wasn't at that class, but some of my teammates actually did the uh, training at the Missoula Library. So we've trained all of the library people here too with that course that we do. Um, I wasn't at that training though. Um, it was other teammates that did it. Now, if, oh, Robert could be joking that a library is letting me talk right now because of the books behind me. That, that's part of my bookshelves. Um, you see the ones here? I have 32 or 33 of these tall bookshelves in the house, stuffed as full as they will get. So that's my library. So I'm glad you like that one, Robert. But they go all the way down the wall, around the corner. Uh, they stop at the exercise machine, then they start again. And I got them up on these walls too. And then we got the ones upstairs. So I like my books. I, you know, I can't say enough about reading and education. <laughs> so, but that's my bookshelf or part of them anyway. <laughs> glad you like them. Other questions about active shooter and the training. You know, that's the focus of today's talk. Um, I can honestly say that not as many people as I put as much into the training. There's a lot of trainings around. I was When I was down in Florida teaching a different thing at the Korean Martial Art Festival a month or so ago, you know, they had an active shooter discussion at their library. It was less than an hour long, and it was a law enforcement officer talking about the run-hide-fight model. Okay, I applaud that they were trying to do something, because something is better than nothing. But just showing the run-hide-fight video and talking about, okay, run, and if you can't run, hide, and if you can't hide, fight, that's not enough. Um, you know, I spent $200 a couple days ago on a new course. It's a seven DVD course on 
firearms training, but the seventh DVD was about active shooter stuff. And so I, I bought the whole DVD system. Uh, for, it's, it's one that Tim Larkin was advertising, uh, because, especially because I want to hear what they have to say on the active shooter stuff, because I buy everything out there on active shooter training um, just to make me a better instructor. Uh, I, you know, I think I owe that to people. And when I learn something from somebody else that's it's good, it makes sense, I'm going to include that because that's how I help people. And I have stacks of books. I mean, everybody knows about Virginia Tech. How many have read that giant thick book on the Virginia Tech incident? Um, you know, I read that because I want to learn more about to be the best instructor I can for people. Um, you know, Robert says it's cool about my books, <laughs> that it's my library, not the downtown library. Um, Steve says, we've just had the suicide bomber in Manchester, UK. What advice do you give about being aware of what possibly happened? Yeah, such a tragic thing, you know, and all those young people killed at what should have been just a fun event. Um, bombs probably scare me way worse than guns. Uh, guns and knives don't scare me as near as much as bombs because if you're in that immediate vicinity of a bomb there's nothing you can do um, if you're in that kill zone we have to be aware and uh, go to surviveashooting.com you know I, I, I'm plugging the website because I just wrote a little blog a couple days ago about things you can look for um, to spot a possible suicide bomber and those same things you can look for to spot a potential active shooter. You know, we're looking for things that are out of the ordinary. You know, we're looking for backpacks where people aren't wearing backpacks. We're looking for big baggy clothing to hide things where you really shouldn't be wearing big baggy clothing. You know, it's hot out. Why are you wearing this coat? We're looking for behaviors. You know, how are they behaving funny? So there is an article that tells things to look for. But you nailed it. First thing is about being aware. We have to be aware in the first place. Okay? And so many of us aren't aware. So we got to be paying attention. Um, the bomb goes off. We don't want to immediately maybe run. It run, it, especially running to that nearest exit, the exit that everybody came in. I told you it's good to know other exits. Um, some of these sickos, they'll plant secondary devices in the avenue where you want to escape. You know, I work in big stadiums sometimes. Uh, bomb goes off. You know, you got to be very careful there's not secondary bombs out in the parking lots. Because that's where everybody's going to want to run and escape to. They will sometimes put car bombs and secondary devices out in those areas. So if an explosion happens and, and you were not seriously injured or killed, you have to be very vigilant and careful that you don't run into another threat. So we still got to be careful of those. Um, so that's a little bit, I hopefully, helps answer that question. Um, I hope I didn't miss some because I see another one by Robert. Do you handle topics like those who should hide the way the very young versus those um, capable of? Yeah, I mean, I teach a lot of teachers. And obviously, if you cannot escape or run, you got to make your, your attacking back and fighting or your barricading and die, denying access stronger. So if you can't escape, you have to be stronger in denying access, barricading your location, or attacking back. That may be being armed if the, if the law allows you to. Um, I know they're going by fast. Let's see. Older and more capable to, make the inst to meet force. Um, yeah. I think it's good, and one of the things about doing training, and while I don't do scenario training in the lot, in the four-hour course because of time constraints, and a lot of times I'm just teaching where they can't shut down a building to do that, but when we do the scenario training in the locations in Missoula where we can shut down the building, that is the best training you're going to get because the people learn about themselves, and they learn can they escape? Can they fight? Are they a better denier? So you need to do a self-assessment, realistic one of what your strengths and weaknesses are. And if you have a weakness that you cannot attack back, you're, you know, for whatever physical reasons, then you look at how would you better escape. If you can't escape because of some physical reasons, how are you prepared to better attack back? Um, 
where are you going that you might have to do these things? If it's going to be a workplace, and um, businesses are the leading place where shooters, active shooters happen, but if it's in your business, how can you modify things to make it easier to barricade, lock down, deny a shooter access to you, so you harden the target? So those are some different things, and we do discuss those in the live classes because people will bring those things up. Well, I have this, and I can't do that. So it's like, all right, well, let's think. What can you do? And having a self-assessment, knowing your strengths and weaknesses will help with that. Um, exits and knowledge when to flee or be ready to fight, even to fight suicide. Yeah. Um, and like I said, a problem is a suicide bomber. I mean, they have been, you know, Lana, they have been stopped when people have noticed them beforehand. When the bomb goes off, it's too late. People have already died if you're in that kill zone. And now we got to start helping others, and making sure there's no secondary devices. Um, we also can strengthen venues and such, and, I, and it sucks. I, you know, I work on both sides of metal detectors and security, because I, I do security for concerts and different events where I'm checking people. I go to places where I got to be checked. It sucks standing in line and being checked. So one thing we can do is we can make sure us, the good people, that we make it easier for those to check us and streamline the process. Those that are doing the checking, make sure that your employer is training you and you're doing it right and we're stopping the threats from getting into some of these places. So it sucks, but with the world we live in today, I'll stand in line a little longer. I'll go a little earlier because I know the line's going to be long, and I will make sure that I'm ready and streamline through that checking process so I can hopefully enjoy safer events. Um, we have to change the civilian mindset to a permanent awareness mindset because can't walk around pretending that an active shooter threat is a far away situation. I, I agree, Charlie, and it doesn't matter if it's an active shooter class a women's safety class, a general stay safe lecture that I give to groups, I am always preaching awareness. And I like Colonel Cooper's uh, color code. It's simple. It stood the test of time. We got to get our head out of our apps, quit being in white, and we got to be in yellow. And yellow is just paying attention to our surroundings, knowing what's going on around us. It's not being paranoid. It's just being aware. And we see the good stuff as well as the potential bad. You can't stop and smell the flowers if you don't see them in the first place. So I'm always preaching that, and I think it's one of the most important lessons in any of my classes. Um, so I appreciate that, Charlie. Um, Steve says, thank you. You're welcome, Steve. Um, Lana says, is there a legit assessment for self? You know, that's a good question, Lana, and maybe that's something I need to put together. Uh, that, that, that's a great idea that, you know, maybe people need help assessing that. I do a ton of assessments in all sorts of different businesses and organizations. You know, there's a ton of things out there. Um, is there a good self-assessment for being safe, knowing your strengths and weaknesses for active threats? Not that I know of. There's assessments for businesses, and there's, there's checklists out there to put together, you know, to harden the target. But that would be a really good thing for me to work on. So thank you, Lana. <clears throat> I'm going to have to remember that. And uh, that would be a good a thing that I could put on the Survive a Shooting website. Uh, Michael asks, how important is it to do a self-pat-down to look for blood or injury after an incident? I'm um, very important. Um, very important because um, the adrenaline and everything that hits you, you may not even know that you're injured um, until that starts to wear off. Um, and our blood vessels constrict and stuff, so sometimes we won't even have a lot of bleeding um, immediately upon that shock of the injury. And it's when we more relax and the adrenal dump starts to wear off um, that the bleeding will start. So it's always important, you know, in, in a situation like that, in an emergency situation, whether it's an explosion, a shooting, a car crash, um, anything like that, to do a quick self-assessment to make sure that you're not injured. Um, because you can miss it with that adrenal jump and the shock and everything that goes on. Um, so very good thing. I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, 
Lana says, yes, help assessing. I think I'd be strong, but. Great. Um, that is something I'll put together, Lana. And as I mentioned before, actually doing a scenario training. You know, Peyton Quinn uh, has been doing that for years at the Rocky Mountain Combat Applications uh, Training Center in Colorado. And, and I've been fortunate enough to be friends with Peyton for years and have worked with him. Um, that's the big thing, that, that scenario training. And that's why law enforcement and military do it. And that's why the Safari Land 8-hour course does it. Um, but it's harder to do. You have to have a team of instructors to do it safely. You have to have a location that you can shut down. Um, it's not financially and logistically feasible for everyone. But if you can get that kind of training, it does tell you a lot about yourself. Uh, Charlie and Bravo share. Hey, I appreciate you guys sharing it. Um, really appreciate that. Hey, Lana says, thanks again, Alan. Great job. You know, I appreciate those words, Lana. You know, it's good having friends like you that are worried about, and I, I won't say even worried. I, I hate that word worried. That are concerned and active about keeping people safe. Because um, I know you have kids in school, um, college age. You have uh, kids in high school and college. Um, you know, we want our colleges and our schools to be safe. And I'll tell you, almost every one of the trainers here in Missoula has kids in the school systems. <laughs> and why we want to make sure that the people here in Missoula are getting the best we can provide. Um, but I care about your kids. I care about everybody's kids because I'm a dad. And I know what I feel about my daughter. And I know everybody feels that way about their children. And I want to make sure all our kids are safe. And that's why I'm trying to get out there. And I'm trying to help folks. Um, yes, I make my living at it. It's a way I provide for my kids and my wife. Um, but I'm providing for them by helping people, by some information that can keep people safe. And that's what it's about. Um, and that's why I've devised this course. And that's why I'm almost you know, done with the book or getting closer to done. I won't say almost, but I'm getting there. I'm working on it. And uh, we're going to get that book out this summer. We're going to keep these courses going. And we're going to make sure that people have a plan. And know what to do because that little bit can mean the difference between life and death. I guarantee you a year ago, 49 people would not have died if those 300 people would have taken my class. I, I you know, and people say, well, how can you can guarantee that? I guarantee that because you talk to people that have been through the courses and you say, and you, you find what, and you talk to them. And they would tell you, yeah, things would have been different if all those 300 people would have been through that class. No way one person should be able to kill 49 out of 300. Um, no, and it should never happen again. And that's why I'm going to get this information out to people. Uh, John just joined. Good to see you, John. Or Josh, I'm sorry. Hard to read the little things flying by, but Josh, good to see you. Lana says, proactive better than reactive. 100%. 100%. That's why we're teaching this stuff. Um, you need to be proactive. Hiding and hoping is not a plan. And unfortunately, most people, that's what their plan is. They, it's a default plan because they know nothing else. Hide and hope for the best. That's not a plan for survival. You know, And that's why in four hours, yeah, four hours... I can give you enough plan that it can make a difference. I encourage people to go beyond what I teach in that four hours and get additional training to be even better. And that is that is better. But even that four hours, I guarantee you, would make a difference in a situation like a year ago at Orlando. Um, Steve says, this is great. Not enough awareness. Everybody sh should do this, should know this. Yeah, I agree, Steve. And that's, and that's why I'm teaching it. Um, you know, my goal is to provide for my family through teaching others to be safe so I can make a difference. And I sincerely hope that no one I teach ever has to do anything. Um, but if something happens, I hope there are people there that have gone through some kind of training and it saves their lives and makes a difference. Um, if there was no such thing as an active threat, if there were no one shooting other people, blowing other people up, stabbing other people, attacking them with machetes, I would fully and gladly go to teaching 
negotiation strategies and conflict resolution strategies. Because I still teach those sometimes to attorneys. Um, different mediation, negotiation, conflict resolution. I still teach those. Um, it's a good way for me to attend a continuing legal education seminars. As an instructor, I don't have to pay to be there, and I get extra credit for teaching, so it helps keep my law license. I would do that 100% gladly and never teach this stuff again if we could just do away with all active threats. Unfortunately, as a student of history, as far back as we can go, People have been doing atrocious things to others and preying on innocent victims. FBI statistics show us that in recent years, these incidents have increased and they're going up. We're, we're seeing it. You can't turn on the news without seeing it. People died in the Philippines yesterday because of this stuff. Um, and they didn't all die by being shot. No, they died the smoke inhalation and all this stuff. But the strategies that I'm teaching could have helped in that situation too. The awareness, the knowing your exits and all these things. So long as people are doing these terrible things, I'm going to keep teaching. And I'm going to help as many people as I can through teaching the tactics and strategies that I do to hopefully enjoy life more safely. Um, any other questions before I uh, sign off? I mean, I've covered most of the things. You know, God, I've been going for quite a while, too. This is sort of long. I, I really appreciate everybody being here. We had some great questions. I hope the information was valuable. Um, I really hope you'll check out the Survive a Shooting website. I'm blogging there, posting stuff that will help people. It's a sister site to Survive and Defend on general safety and self-defense. Um, Again, thank you for the questions. Got one more coming in. Hey, Randy Enos just joined. Another one of those paratroopers I served with back in the 80s. Airborne all the way, Randy. Good to see you, buddy. You know, no, Fletch was on here earlier. Not sure if he's still on, but you know, these are guys I used to jump out of airplanes with. And you always got a special place for those guys. Um, couldn't serve with a better group of people than I served with when I was with the U.S. Army, both with the 82nd and the 2nd ID in Korea. Uh, Robert says, yeah, the Philippines was actually fighting jihadists before 9-11 happened. Yes, uh, stuff's been going on forever. You look at history, people have been doing atrocious things to others as far back as we can go. And that's why I'm going to teach people to be safe, because I don't see it stopping anytime soon. It, it's just increasing by what some of the statistics are showing us. Um, Lana gave a thumbs up. Thank you again, Lana. Charlie saying... If you are a family guy, it's important to train having in mind that you are not alone in an active shooter situation. You must teach your loved ones to act and react like a compact team, um, well coordinated in the same direction. What do you think about it? I agree, Charlie. You have to be on the same sheet of music with your coworkers at work and with your family when you're out and about. And that plan is going to change as your family changes. If you have little ones in strollers, the plan is different than if you got high school sons about to go into the Marine Corps, graduate high school and go off to the Marine Corps. It's going to be different with your family members. If you have a special needs child, um, it's going to be different. Um, your, your spouse or your significant other, their abilities is going to dictate what you do. So your plan has to be situated to your family. And you should always have that plan. I was probably one of the only people last summer at Universal Studios going through the Harry Potter world with my wife and daughter pointing out the emergency exits as we had the closest one, always knowing where the closest emergency exit was. And that didn't prevent me from having a great time with my family. But we always know where the exit was. And I knew what I was going to do if anything bad were to happen. And it's not an, necessarily an active shooter, but Southern California is known for earthquakes. And there's been huge earthquakes right close to Universal Studios. Well, if an earthquake would have happened, I'm going to keep my family safe and go to the exits away from the tramp, trampling that can happen with the chaotic, scared, panicked crowd. So... It's good reason to bring that up, Charlie. We have to be on board with our te teammates that we're with. We have to be on board with our coworkers that we're with. 
We have to be on board with our family that we're with. And it's going to change in those different situations. Um, Robert says, Coasty vet here, so well met fellow vet. All right, good job, Robert. Another vet. Um, Enos says, airborne brother. And that's Randy, my uh, airborne brother from back in 86 and 87. I said goodbye to Randy in February of 88, because that's when I moved off to Korea and he stayed with the 82nd. So, but we served in 86, 87, jumping out of planes together. So, airborne, Randy. Good to see you here, bud. Um, and if you're in, if you if you see Randy here, and you're in his area, and you need some work done on tile and stuff, I've seen pictures of some of the bathrooms and stuff he's done. Get a hold of him. Does some great work there. Uh, Charlie says safety and awareness must become a lifestyle. It should. And a lot of people say what I teach is common sense, Charlie. And I say yes, it is. And for somebody like you, somebody like me, it's common sense. We're, we're being safe, we have safe habits, and we're aware. Unfortunately, common sense is not commonly practiced. I still see people all over the place with their head in their apps and not paying attention. Um, and that's just not the way to live. And it's not paranoia. It's enjoying life. I'm not scared not leaving my house. That's being paranoid. I'm going out. I said, I, I was out at you know Universal Studios and Las Vegas and all those places enjoying that vacation. But I made sure that myself and my family were safe doing it. We're going places this summer. We're going to be safe. We're going to enjoy life safely. That's what it's all about. And awareness, like Charlie said, is number one. And it's just it, it's part of what you do. And it allows you to enjoy the good things too. We're not always looking for bad. We notice the bad when we're looking at everything. And we notice the good stuff too and we don't miss out on things. Conversation starter. 50 comments so far. That's great. Chuck and six others shared. Hey, I appreciate the shares. Um, you know, it's, unless there's another question, I was going to sign off a couple minutes ago and then got a couple more good questions, so I stayed on. Glad I did because I got to see Randy, airborne brother from the 82nd. Um, anything else? Or I'll be signing off. Um, if you're listening to this on a replay and you got a question, put it in the comments because I'll go back and check those comments for things later and answer those the best I can too. Again, go to the new website, SurviveAShooting.com. Some good stuff there. I'll continue to blog. Survive a Shooting Facebook page also has good stuff. So go to any of those for more information on this topic. If I can help you or your organization, contact me. If you need a formal proposal for your board, I'll send them a formal proposal with all the different you know, course objectives and all of that that they need to make the decision to cut the checks and bring me in there to teach you guys. So whatever you need, I'll help and I'll work with your organization to get the training to help people. Um, on your vacation, between the melting ice caps since we left the Accord, <laughs> beware of the melting ice caps. I will be aware of melting ice caps, and if I see any, well, my daughter's a great swimmer, you know, so we made sure she learned to swim as a young one, so we'll swim to the nearest boat. <laughs> so, all right, thank you, Garen. Thank you, everybody. Um, if I can help you, get in, get in touch. That's what I want to do, all right? Take care. Stay safe.